Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Clouds still around, but we are about to see a chance of snow. How much of this is going to end up on the ground by tomorrow morning's commute? All right, Ben, also a father gunned down just moments after dropping his child off at school. A family now torn apart as police hunt for a killer. But first, we're getting our first look at the man now charged with murdering his wife inside a Commerce Township home while their children were inside. Thanks for being with us. That video you just saw was Noah Ravenscroft being arraigned on charges of first degree murder and the deadly stabbing of his wife, Christy. We bring in Jason Colthorpe, who's live with more on the new things that we learned in court today. Jason. Yeah, Devin, this was a brutal murder scene. And of course, as you say, the three children of this couple home at the time, police finding them on the second floor. And as it turns out, it was their little girl that called 911. Police got the call Monday night from a heartbreaking source. The 911 caller, a 10 year old child, indicated that her father, Noah Ravenscroft, was hurting her mother and uh, went to the kitchen to retrieve a knife. Police say Noah Ravenscroft used that kitchen knife to stab his wife, Christy, to death while their three children were in the house. Police arrived at the home on Applebrook in Commerce Township and say Ravenscroft answered the door. He was covered in blood and made spontaneous statements that he killed his wife. The 36-year-old Ravenscroft faced a judge this afternoon on charges of first-degree premeditated murder. Court would also note that there is a substantial amount of evidence you were the only person that could have been responsible for this at this time. He said almost nothing until the judge explained he could not have any contact with Christie's family, including their children. I don't understand. You're not to have any contact with anybody that's related to Christie, Joe, Lynn, Ravenscroft at this time. And again, that includes his own children. He did stand mute, pleading not guilty to those charges. Ravenscroft will be back in court next week. Guys, back to you. All right, Jason. Our other top story tonight, a Detroit father shot and killed just after dropping his child off at school. Just after 8 o'clock this morning, right in front of Mark Twain Elementary Middle School in southwest Detroit. Paula Tutman following this story since it broke this morning. And Paula, the shooter is still on the run. Yeah, last check, police say they still don't have anyone in custody. I can tell you this, somebody saw something because they've got a pretty darn good description of this guy. Also, we spoke to family members and friends. We're getting two different views of this gentleman, Keenan Beard, and his family members say they begged him, begged him to stay out of this neighborhood for a very specific reason. Shante Brown watches the front door of Mark Twain Elementary School in agony. <laughs> <laughs> School drop off at Mark Twain in southwest Detroit. The little boy says goodbye to his father, walks into the school, and then shots ring out. This man, Keenan Beard, slumps and is discovered by another parent as she walks to her vehicle after dropping off her child. We believe the son went into the school, and the suspect, who may have entered the car after or was in the car with him uh, during the transport of his son. Now police are looking for a brazen killer. A tale of two Keenan Beards begins to emerge at once. Both will be important to find that killer, still on the run. Families say Keenan was a devoted father who dropped his six-year-old son off for school every morning. He's a good guy, good father. Him and his son is like best friends. They were just planning for his birthday party, which is um, on the 27th. But he also had a record out on parole for less than six months after doing about a year behind bars. And in fact, just last year, he survived a gun attack just blocks away from the school. They shot up him, his car, and the only thing he did was get shot in the ankle. There's a lot of enemy that was out to him. I'm sorry. Why did, he, just, why did he have enemies? Just a lot of people didn't like him, and I just wish he stayed away. You know, I, I, here's the thing we need to be thinking about right now. Not only finding a killer, and police are looking for him, but a six-year-old little boy who lost his father. I mean, he was really feet away. School door right here, car right there. Um, hearts definitely go out to that little boy. And again, police are, are they say they've got a, a description. They're looking for this guy. Guys, back to you. And let's hope uh, some tips start to come in because no doubt somebody saw something this morning in a crowd like that. All right, Paula.
Well, time to uh, snap back to reality here on the winter front. We have much chillier weather now on the way. You're right, but before that happens, we've got some rain on the way, too. Let's check in with Ben. Hi, Ben. Hi, Kim and Devin. Yeah, the rain is out there in spots. Most of us, though, just cloudy. Doesn't look or really feel a whole lot different than it has for the last several days. Temperatures in Metro at 44. Wind chills just behind that as the winds remain light. That's going to change later on tonight and tomorrow. Four Live Radar does have a couple sprinkles here. Most of these are in our north zone and and fairly light, but overnight as temperatures start to take a little bit of a tumble, those few sprinkles that we see around are going to turn into snow. Yes, snow. Uh, we will be seeing that uh, in the forecast through tomorrow. We'll talk about accumulation possibilities and believe it or not, the sunshine will emerge in the seven day forecast. We'll look at that coming up in a few minutes. Mary Tyler Moore, a TV legend, really revolutionary as she broke down barriers and changed the perception of women in television. That she did, and today at the age of 80, she died in a Connecticut hospital. A career spanning decades, her first big break came when she played a mother who refused to play second fiddle to her husband on The Dick Van Dyke Show. The 25-year-old was cast in what would become one of television's most treasured comedies. Kind of heavy. Playing a legendary role, housewife Laura Petrie. Are you uh, angry with me for something? What makes you think that? More won two Emmys, turned Capri pants into a fashion sensation, and shared a sparkling chemistry with Dick Van Dyke that made marriage look sexy. Excuse me. Hello. Hello. A very different role followed for Moore in 1970. You got spunk. <laughs> well, yes. I hate spunk. <laughs> the Mary Tyler Moore Show introduced Mary Richards. The series won three straight Emmys as best comedy. Laugh for Chuck. <laughs> it made stars of the cast and led to three spin-off series. It also produced one of television's most memorable final episodes. It was my family. As I said, the dialogue in that last episode, thank, thank you, you for being, being my family, family. it's just very difficult to say goodbye. But it's a pair of beloved characters that will be Mary Tyler Moore's enduring legacy, one destined to keep the world turned on and smiling. And uh, you're looking live right now at uh, her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame there. You see people coming by taking pictures. It looks like looks like there might be some flowers there as well. We don't know much about the cause of death, but more battled diabetes for years. She had brain surgery in 2011. Breaking news right now. We've just learned a draft of an executive order shows President Trump plans to stop issuing visas to Syrian refugees and those from seven other countries with Muslim majorities for at least 30 days. Word of that coming on the same day the president announced plans to keep a major campaign promise, a wall built on the Mexican border. He also seems to be holding on to a grudge and is now promising a federal investigation into the unproven charge that he was cheated by voter fraud. Steve Handelsman is the latest from the White House. Steve. Devin, thanks, and good evening from the White House. The news that President Trump will order a federal investigation of the election that he won is competing today with the news the president made on the wall. At the Department of Homeland Security, President Trump said his immigration crackdown will save thousands of lives, millions of jobs, and billions of dollars. Beginning today, the United States of America gets back control of its borders keeping his signature campaign pledge i will build a great great wall on our southern border it would run 1900 miles and cost an estimated 15 to 25 billion dollars and because mexico is refusing to pay mr trump asked congress to at this point his goal was to get the project started as quickly as possible using existing funds and resources. Cheaper drones, towers, and detectors would work, said John McCain, the senator from Arizona. And yes, we can secure our border, but it isn't just with, quote, building a wall. President Trump also ordered criminals without papers to be deported and to cut off federal funds to cities like New York that offer sanctuary to undocumented migrants. I have no higher duty than to protect the lives of the American people. But on the day the Dow hit 20,000, the president again distracted from his own moves on prosperity and security, tweeting, I will be asking for a major investigation into voter fraud, using his new powers to escalate his unfounded claim 
that he lost the popular vote because millions of what he called illegals voted. Those are among the kinds of people that President Trump moved today to keep out and kick out of our country. At the White House, Steve Handelsman, Local 4. All right, Steve, and coming up at 6 o'clock, our Paula Tutman out talking with Metro Detroiters who might be most impacted by the new restrictions put forth by the White House today. We'll hear the concerns of Muslim Americans and others at 6 o'clock. Also, for the first time ever, as Steve mentioned, the Dow has hit the 20,000 mark. The Dow has surged more than 1,700 points since President Trump's victory in November. Today, the market closed at just over 20,000. That's a huge improvement from when the Dow crashed to a low of nearly 6,500 back in March of 2009. Tonight, the reward to catch Wayne State University Police Sergeant Colin Rose's killer is now more than $82,000. Rose was gunned down the week of Thanksgiving while investigating car break-ins just off campus. Last night, police released pictures of a flashlight and a bicycle they believe were used by the killer. If you've got any tip at all, no matter how a small a tip or detail you think it might be, you're urged to contact Detroit yeah, Police. Huge reward. Yeah. Much more ahead, including Defender Kevin Dietz. Hi, Kevin. A mother's journey for justice for her murdered son takes a new twist. Will the federal courts be able to put the man she thinks killed her son behind bars? The story is coming up. All right, Kevin, and Art Van Elslander says it's time for a changing of the guard. The big decision he made today about the furniture company he founded and what it could mean for the thousands of people who work for that company. The Defenders on the Money Trail. After this, local woman is charged with embezzlement from the Autism Society. Were you even aware of these charges? Who is she? The defenders take you inside the investigation next. New at six. Could Detroit's best known drug offender finally gain freedom in time to see the movie about his life? Defender Kevin Dietz reveals why the chances for Rick Wershey's release just got much, much higher. Also, I guess you'd say it's one of Metro Detroit's most prolific criminals. New at six, why the 66-year-old man has been arrested for the 15th time. Okay, now to a local four defenders investigation. A local woman is in trouble with the law after prosecutors say she embezzled from a local charitable organization. And making it even more disturbing, she was the president of that organization intended to help families living with autism. Defender Karen Drew with our exclusive report today. Karen. A lot of people are really surprised at this one. The Autism Society of Oakland County was formed to provide programs and services that enhance the quality of life for people with autism and their families. But that's been made very difficult after the nonprofit says its very own president embezzled nearly $100,000 from the organization. No one expected to see this. Barbara Brennan in court facing three charges of embezzlement. Most in the community remember her like this from this photo taken when she accepted a big donation for the Autism Society of Oakland County, telling people donations were going towards workshops to teach those with autism real world skills. But no more photo ops for this Rochester woman, unless you count this mugshot. Now, Brennan is facing three counts of embezzlement from a nonprofit charitable organization, according to court paperwork, taking nearly $100,000. This is where Brennan lives, on this dirt road in Rochester. When the defenders decided to make a surprise visit, her husband answered the door. Or is she still here? No, she's at work. Were you even aware of these charges, or were you surprised? Not, not until it happened. Okay, so you don't know necessarily where the money went. Ms. Brennan, who is... Brennan made an appearance in court this week, but didn't say much. Her trial is scheduled for April 17th. She faces up to 30 years in prison. Meantime, the Autism Society of Oakland County issued this statement to the defenders, reading in part, the Autism Society of Oakland County was devastated to discover that our former president had embezzled over $100,000 from us. All of the stolen money was donated by the community and was intended to serve the needs of these individuals and their families. Our former president betrayed the trust we placed in her, and we have taken additional measures to prevent this from ever happening again. The Autism Society went on to say it encourages all charities to make sure 
that they have the proper checks and balances in place to prevent what happened to them. They didn't expect it. She was the president. They yeah. trusted her. Yeah. yeah, of course. And I know you dug into Barbara Brennan's past. Not a lot there, but a few. No, things. she did have. A, we found a conviction for non-sufficient funds in 2003 and a no account check back in 1998. Yeah. Her jury trial is set for you know a few weeks, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, you know, we know you'll keep us posted, Karen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we found it. This this is probably the video of the day. <laughs> what is it? Dial this in. No way. That large orb, bright orb <laughs> in the sky. That's not here, is it? A star, not too far away. <laughs> it was. You know, it was here. The sun. No way. But. Ben, as quickly as it arrived, <laughs> the clouds it's took gone. it right back. <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't run a breaking news alert before we uh, yeah. ran that video. Forgot I forgot mean, what it looked like. It has been we we weren't sure it wasn't fake <laughs> yeah. news. I was like, what is <laughs> <was> it? <laughs> <laughs> first. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, there was just a glimpse today. Mm -hmm. uh, the clouds are back and probably will be from most of the first half of the forecast, but there is some sun in there. You've Good. just got to find it hard here as we get into the seven day forecast, but it is 44 outside right now. Again, temperatures really not the problem. South Southwest winds are at seven, so the wind chill just a little bit behind that. Visibility slightly reduced at six miles, but the real fog is just off to our north. Uh, closer to the uh, Saginaw Bay and the Thumb. They've also got some snow showers up there as well. We are at 44. Most of the area, except for some of the uh, folks in the north zone, are dry right now. Uh, we do have some rain showers out there, but look at the cold air that is poised to move in. 21 up in Bismarck, 28 right now in Sioux Falls. Twin Cities are below freezing as well as Duluth. Uh, high temperatures, though, will still make the 30s as we get through the upcoming day. So really, we're only going to see these temperatures fall about 10 degrees on average uh, from where we're at right now. Here's a look now at the satellite and radar, and you can see how the moisture sort of curling back around this low. This is more of what is going to affect us overnight. There's not a whole lot out there right now other than those showers that are north of the city. So as that low gets closer to us overnight, we'll see those rain showers turn over to snow showers. I don't think we're going to see any accumulation except for areas that are in our north zone. Maybe enough uh, to coat the ground in a couple spots, but nothing significant. However, there will still be flakes flying as we get through the commute tomorrow morning, and then generally this will start to taper off as we get through the next few days. Notice that this flows out of the northwest as we get into the upcoming weekend. That's going to keep this pattern pretty active, and that's also going to really can't rule out uh, a flake or a flurry uh, hanging around all the way through the weekend. So it is going to feel more like winter, and it's also going to look more like winter as we finally get some snowflakes back here in southeast. Michigan 34 tonight again that rain turning to wet snow late as we get towards tomorrow morning but highs really not going much of anywhere 37 is just about as good as we get we're going to break down those lows in our four zone forecast tonight notice also that pretty much everywhere uh, this is going to be cold enough to support snow 33 34 in our metro zone south zone temperatures pretty much on par there maybe 32 out in Onstead some areas will be below freezing here in our west zone Fenton Clarkston Milford you'll be down to 31 and 32 and 33 closer to Michigan Avenue. North zone temperatures for overnight lows right around 32 generally across most of the zone. And this is the area too uh, where we get the better chance of seeing at least a couple of those snow showers uh, putting down something on the ground. Otherwise, once we get into the second half of the weekend, start breaking up those clouds. Monday, partly cloudy sky, seeing a little bit more sunshine. We take a brief break for some snow there on Tuesday as a clipper system rolls through here. But the sun does come back Wednesday and even towards the end of the forecast going into next weekend. So three sunshines. Yeah, it's, it we'll take what we can get. It. It's been a while, but it's <laughs> yes. good to have a bit. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. All right, here's what consumer investigator Hank Winchester has coming up a little later. Spring break destinations that could save you big money. Destinations you may not expect. We'll have the latest for you in my Help Me Hank consumer alert. All right, Hank, with first stories from across the state of Michigan, including a man armed with a machete trying to fend off attackers at his home. Next. Let's check out stories from across Michigan this Wednesday. Stories from Hancock, way up north in the UP, also Bay City. But we want to start in Grand Rapids. That's where a man was shot several times while defending himself against intruders with a machete. Happened before dawn today at the man's home near Grand Valley State University's downtown campus. Police say the 20 year old heard a knock on his door and was confronted by three masked suspects. The man tried to defend himself with a machete, but was shot several times. He's expected to survive. No arrests have been made. A Bay County man accused of using two guns to kill a dog he says was bothering him while out deer hunting accepted a plea deal. 
before the trial was set to begin. Tuesday, Tyler McKeon pleaded no contest to one count of attempted killing or torturing an animal. In exchange, prosecutors dropped the charge of actually killing or torturing an animal. McKeon uh, now faces two years in prison. His plea acceptance comes after a Bay County farmer testified he heard two types of gunfire before finding his dog dead on a neighbor's property. Well, this unusually warm winter that we're having has now led to the cancellation of a big fun, fun winter tradition up in the UP. We're talking about the polar plunge here in Hancock. Normally, it sees hundreds of people jumping into the cold water of Portage Lake downtown. The plunge was set for Saturday, but it's been canceled due to the ice being too thin for polar plungers to walk on. You know it's an unusual winter when it's canceled we in the have UP. We to cancel the polar plunge the because it's too warm, basically. They're, they're still going to have the parade, and they have yeah. the women's, they, they carry the wife-carrying contest. Oh, you know, right. They're yes, still going to yeah, have that, yeah. though. <laughs> still a part of it. Uh, back with more in just a second. Nick? New at 530. And a barricaded gunman all morning long in Wixom holed up in that apartment right there. But once the SWAT team moved in, even they were surprised what they found. It is one of those Metro Detroit big name business names. This is not a financial transition which is going to impact our customers negatively. Anyway. And it's about to get new ownership. But will that change anything? We'll let you know ahead. The federal courts to the rescue. A mother looking for justice for her murdered son is hoping that the U.S. Attorney's Office can put the man she says is responsible behind bars for a decade. The story is next. It's dinner time. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. A heartbroken mother desperate for justice. Why she says the man who murdered her son got a slap on the wrist and what she says she plans to do about it. Tonight, the Local 4 defenders are on the case. Ocean Lockett went missing back in July of 2016. Months later, the 19-year-old's body was found in a sewer. Since that day, his mother has been working tirelessly to try to bring her son's killer to justice. Outside. Defender Kevin Dietz is following the story. And uh, Kevin, she believes the court case basically fell through the cracks. Yeah, you know, this is quite a case. Police and prosecutors say they believe they know who the murderer is. They just cannot prove it right now at this time. So while he's not being charged with murder, he is being charged with different crimes, and they're asking a judge to absolutely hammer him with a lengthy prison sentence. Take a look. I'm like so grateful right now. Yeah. I really want to cry, but I'm a big girl, so I try not to cry. Brenda Burton is grateful that her prayers may soon be answered. Seeking justice for her son's murder has been a long and disappointing journey. 19-year-old Ocean Lockett went missing in July 2015. Hundreds searched the neighborhoods he was last seen in. Then a water worker found his dead body in a sewer. They killed him. They shot him in the head four times and drug him down an alley and put him in a sewer. Michael Ferguson was the main suspect, but the witness proved unreliable. He pleaded guilty to a two-year gun charge. Ocean's mother says that's not justice. Everybody should be accounted, accountable for what they do. Everybody. But now the U.S. Attorney's Office is stepping in. They, too, have a gun charge against Michael Ferguson and want to hammer him with 10 years in prison, way above the recommended sentence. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm happy, and I'm grateful to them, and I feel like justice needs to be served. Making their case in part by telling the judge Ferguson is a suspect in Ocean Lockett's murder, making public evidence photos, including a picture of Ocean's dead body in the sewer. The photo breaks Brenda's heart, but she supports the U.S. Attorney's effort. If that'll help with the case, I don't mind, because I've seen it. I'm the one that found him, me and my two sons. We took the top off the sewer and looked down in there. In court filings, Ferguson's attorney is crying foul. He's saying, you can't do that. You can't punish his client for a crime that he's not been charged or convicted of. He says, yes, his client made mistakes selling guns, and he's willing to do the time for that crime, but not the 10 years that prosecutors want him to spend behind bars. On February the 7th, the judge will decide exactly how much time Mr. Ferguson will spend in prison. Kevin Dietz, Defenders. Now, Kevin, Ocean Lockett's murder is classified as unsolved, so what happens with that investigation? Yeah, so this is a strategic move by prosecutors. If they charged him now and they lost the case, they could never come back and charge him later. That'd be double jeopardy. This way, they leave it open. If new evidence surfaces or a new witness surfaces down the road, they say they can charge Ferguson with that murder yeah. as well. Yeah. All right, Kevin. 
Other news tonight, folks uh, sound asleep in Wixom were startled awake after hearing three gunshots. Pretty scary. It happened at the Village Apartments near Beck Road and Pontiac Trail. Not knowing if someone was hurt or dead, SWAT teams were called in and eventually used a flashbang to get inside. But as Nick Manicelli reports, this didn't end as expected. Four adults and two small children were found inside. Well, after that flashbang and the SWAT team was able to move in, they found something they were not suspecting. As you mentioned, inside of that apartment were a total of four adults and two children. So the investigation had to begin immediately. Who was who? I could feel it. It was, it was definitely close. Daquan Jackson told his wife to get on the floor. And when he looked outside, he realized the gunshots we're coming from across the hall. And I'm looking out the window. I don't see anybody. I hear people. I hear the steps. Like I hear people moving around. I look out the window. I mean, out my people. I see the door open. I can see a baby with a diaper right there in the door. And I hear somebody like, "Hey, shut the door! Shut the door!" That flashbang is how all of this ended, distracting whoever was inside the apartment, so the Oakland County SWAT team could move in. But it took hours to get to that point. The weird thing was is that. Uh, the shots weren't all together. They were like spread out, almost like somebody was lighting fireworks. Rick Vogel is one of several people who heard three gunshots spaced apart and called 911 around 1.45 a.m. Within minutes, Wixom police officers were here. They saw a man on this balcony who then ran back inside and would not be heard from again. Not long after, maybe five minutes, the, the police were knocking on doors saying that they were they wanted to get us out of there. In all, more than a dozen neighbors were evacuated just in case. And nearly four hours later, at 5.51 a.m., the flashbang did the trick. Inside, though, were four adults and two kids, a toddler and an infant. Investigators aren't sure yet who played what role, and CPS will be involved in the care of the children. In Wixom, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Investigators say only one of the four people they detained are being cooperative. A Washington Township man is going to spend up to 30 years behind bars after he injured his infant son, causing him to go blind. 22-year-old Anthony Robinson was watching the little boy back in July when the child's mother came home. She found he was hurt and called 911. Doctors say the boy's injuries were consistent with shaken baby syndrome, resulting in blindness. During his sentencing, family members spoke on behalf of the little boy. In addition to the disgust and anger that fills my broken heart <laughs> and the many questions that I have, I ask, how could you? <laughs> how could you? A judge sentenced Robinson to up to 30 years in prison. Well, we're talking to Ben over here in the Weather Center and... Uh... I'm seeing some r snow coming. Snow's coming, rain's coming. At least it's not just clouds. That's true. And you needed a little mix it up from all those gray skies, yeah, right? We were getting bored over here in the weather <laughs> department. We needed something. Uh, four live radars just got rain out there right now, though. That's with the green showing up, and it's mainly in our north zone. Even the stuff that's out there is pretty light, so we're talking a quick shower, maybe a patch of drizzle, and that's going to be about it. Temperatures will drop tonight, and that does mean that we will see a transition from this rain to snow, but it's not going to be until after the evening is done. So generally, temperatures are going to fall from the low 40s. Uh, we're calling it right at 40, but there's still quite a spread in numbers between uh, the areas down south towards the Ohio State line and up in our north zone. So we will be seeing temperatures cooler tonight becoming all snow for just about everybody. And we'll show you what that means for the morning commute coming up in a few minutes. Okay. All right, Ben. Art Van Furniture will soon have a new owner. The huge furniture chain is going to sell all of its shares to a private equity firm and a sale expected to close in the next couple of weeks. So what does this all mean for customers, workers, and to Metro Detroit as a whole? For some answers, let's get out to live. Uh, our business editor, Rod Maloney, he joins us now live from Sterling Heights. Hi, Rod. Hi there, Karen. You know, here's the thing. This is one of those great Michigan bootstrap type stories, right? You got Little Caesars, you got Domino's, you got Kmart, among others that started small, grew big. Well, Art Van Furniture can claim that kind of success story as well. And they've got 100 stores now. They're doing well, but they're talking about doubling the size of the company here in the next couple of years. It's just that Art Van is not going to be there for it. 
Art Van Furniture started 58 years ago in this East Point building that is now a foreign car store. Art Van Elslander himself took his single store and grew it into a local and then regional power with more than 100 stores now. Art himself is the sole shareholder and his son Gary, who is the company president, says it was a cleaner transaction for his dad to cash out and transition into a happy retirement. You know, we have a very large family and the transition uh, to my father to private equity really uh, just made a lot of sense for a lot of reasons for the long-term growth of the company. Art Van employs 3,700 people right now who got the news about the sale first thing this morning. The vast majority of Art Van furniture is custom designed and built exclusively for the company in southern U.S. plants. Much of it shipped from this Sterling Heights distribution center. The new owner is going to be Boston private equity firm Thomas H. Lee Partners, which owns financial services, health care, and pet food companies, among other businesses. It liked Art Van because the company is in that growth spurt. And Art Van CEO Kim Yost says there should be no worry about private equity pairing things back. This is not a financial transition which is going to impact our customers negatively. Anyway. If anything, it's great for our customers because it ensures a brand for its next transition in the decades to come. All right, I'm going to put my financial planner hat on here for a minute because there is that question, you know. I mean, you've got Art Van's son as president and his other son as one of the vice senior executive vice president. So why didn't they take it over? Well, here's what happens. Normally, like with the Little Caesars, Mike and Mary Nillis were able to get the kids come in and take the business over and it prospered, okay? But the vast majority of businesses that start like this and then hand it down to the children don't always fare so well. You get the impression that perhaps Art Van felt like it would be better for him and his fortune when he wants to pass it on to his family that he controls it that way instead of doing it through the business. Reporting live in Sterling Heights, Rod Maloney. Local force. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. All right, Rod. Well, the Secret Service is taking action after a controversial Facebook post. Special Agent Carrie O'Grady wrote a post suggesting she would not take a bullet for Donald Trump if he were president. A Secret Service spokesperson confirmed that the agency was aware of the post, saying they're, quote, taking appropriate action. The posts were reportedly written in October, but came under the spotlight after a Washington Examiner article on Tuesday. O'Grady told the Examiner that she took down the post and that she would not shirk her duties to protect the president. It's official. The Boston Celtics have reached an agreement with General Electric to be the team's jersey sponsor. Yes, you heard that right. Oh, things are changing. Uh -huh. The company's logo will now be on the team's uniform. This is because last April, the NBA approved a plan allowing for sponsorships on uniforms. The Celtics were the third team to announce a deal. General Electric is in the process of moving its corporate headquarters from Connecticut to an old candy factory on the Boston waterfront. The move is expected to be completed next year. At least it's small. Right. Something that bothers me on that jersey. That, that's the one well, that is so Well, it seems so, so iconic. traditional. I know, and I know. Uh, but the future is on its way. Mm -hmm. uh, a new law going on the books in Ohio will make it legal to run red lights. But there is a catch. New tonight, what it is and why you still could end up getting pulled over. Also, the need for speed. New tonight, the one thing Ford's new supercar GT does that they claim sets a new record. Hank? It's time to start thinking about spring break travel. We're revealing the hottest destinations out there on a budget. What you need to know coming up new tonight. New at six. Sweeping immigration change on the part of the Trump administration, applauded by some, but certainly not all. I'll have that story. Plus, Dr. McGeorge gets to the bottom of a new warning about whooping cough in schools in Oakland County. Time to pack your bags. Help me, Hank, revealing the spring break deals that uh, any family can afford tonight, the warm destinations that will not break the bank. And with all of our grayness that we've had, uh, it would be nice, nice to, to get about. away, right? Uh -huh. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester joins us and obviously booking early is the key. I just heard you guys during the commercial break talking about vacation. Yes, Ready to go. we were. Ready to go. You're on top of it. <laughs> we want you to be on top of it. Listen, there are still a lot of great deals out there. For spring break, maybe don't think Miami or Cancun. Think about a smaller city where you can get more bang for your buck. 
Sun, fun, and beach. Spring break quickly approaching. If you haven't booked your trip, do it now. It just depends on what your focus what you is. Yeah. Is it just to not be in two feet of snow yeah. <laughs> or to have a beautiful it's sunrise? For Pam Nikitas with Joan Anderson Travel in Detroit says there are still good deals out there, but instead of Miami, Orlando, or Cancun, think of these destinations. Destin, Florida, Fort Myers, Florida, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, or Savannah, Georgia. Destin, known for its beaches, but it's also a destination that you could drive to if you were on a budget. And you can just sit on the beach and just watch the sunrise and sunset. Fort Myers, direct flights available from Detroit, many hotel or condo rental options, and Naples nearby. They would enjoy getting bikes and going into the old town. Myrtle Beach and Savannah, also not as busy as destinations in Florida during spring break, and there are still big deals out there. You fly into Savannah and then you drive in a couple, an hour and a half and you're in Hilton Head. Oh my gosh, you could play, um, you've got golf, you've got tennis. If you're a foodie, you will love it. And when booking airfare on a budget, think outside of Detroit Metro. Would you go out of Toledo? So if somebody says, no, I just want to go out of Detroit, then it narrows it down. So you may want to look at Flint Bishop Airport as an option, uh, Toledo, as she mentioned, but maybe even heading down to Cleveland. Yeah, you have to drive a couple of hours, but you could save a lot of money flying out of smaller airports or airports that offer a more charter service than mm -hmm. maybe yeah. Detroit Metro does. Windsor can also be. Yeah. Windsor's right. a good one for international, yeah. right? For international. Yeah. And you can save if you bundle, right? Right. If you do airfare hotel together, you can do a lot. Travel agents are really good with helping you find, you know, condos and different yeah. things like yeah. that. So a lot of options. Just do it now. Right. All right. Good I homework. Like yeah. I like it. Let's do it. All right. <laughs>